So this is a drawing work with my colleague at Tsinghua, uh, uh, my colleague Bin Jin Wu. So this is a little bit from, different from Arbor's talk. This is on the uh, higher end of labor market, the, higher, uh, the uh, students who, uh, uh, most, of, most, of, most of whom uh, go to college. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, inequality uh, uh, that is uh, shown by the uh, so-called college entrance exams and uh, admissions. Uh, as many of you may know that China's inequality has been rising uh, uh, very fast. At least people have been talking about uh, uh, inequality is rising really fast, either using income, using wealth, or consumption uh, to measure inequality. But as a matter of fact, uh, as long as, as I know, until today, nobody knows the true inequality of China. Nobody can really measure inequality of China, the Gini coefficient, because we don't have a good uh, income survey, a uh, uh, household survey that can really measure the income of all people uh, uh, in the country. That's why, I mean, if, uh, it's hard to know what's the true uh, income housing price ratio, so it's because we don't have a good income uh, measure. Uh, there's another literature that talks about, uh, uh, the first literature is basically is measure inequality, how large it is. So the second literature is talking about how stable it is, or how mobile uh, Chinese population is whether uh, uh, if the, uh, the, uh, the income is mobile, then that means uh, the rich, their next generation can become poor, and the poor, the ne next generation can become rich. If a society is not mobile, that means the inequality will be transferred from one generation to the next, uh, which is not good for society. Uh, uh, so today, uh, my talk is related to both literature. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, 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 use a very good data to measure inequality in education. Uh, education inequality is also related, related to uh, mobility in society. Uh, uh, for those, who know, uh, those of you who uh, uh, don't know much about Chinese education, I'm going to briefly talk about it. Uh, so we have a so-called nine-year compulsory education, which consists of uh, six years in primary school and three years in junior high school. Uh, uh, so, until today, most urban kids complete the compulsory uh, com uh, edu education. I think also the majority of rural kids also have nine years education uh, uh, now. After the uh, nine years compulsory education, uh, uh, kids can either uh, go to high school or go to a technical high school. For those who go to high school, you have two choices. You either take science or social science and arts. For science students, uh, we take physics, chemistry, biology, and more difficult math. For art or social science students, uh, you don't have to take physics or chemistry. You only have to take geography, history, and easy math. Uh, every year, uh, June 7th and 9th, this is the only time in a year, uh, there's a so-called centralized uh, college entrance exam. This is a very important date for Chinese, actually. Uh, uh, for many of us, it's fate determining. Uh, so this is the uh, student trying to get into the gate of the exam room. Uh, uh, so when they come out, the parents are asking them, how well have you done? Is it difficult or easy? Uh, so uh, this uh, daddy is uh, praying for, for his kid. Uh, so even the police is helping uh, this little girl. Uh, because she could be late, actually. Uh, he's taking her to the classroom uh, for the exam. You can see that there is uh, traffic control. On the street, you see no car driving, actually. Uh, but this is a very important date. Uh, uh, even the police are coming out uh, to help. Uh, so this is just uh, give you an impression how important this exam is. This is nothing like SAT in the US uh, is, uh, or GRE. So. <laughs> so either before the exams or after the exams, uh, students need to fill in their applications, also called preferences for colleges, also for major. Uh, so this varies by time and by location. Uh, some places have it before the exam, some after the exam. Uh, some provinces have it uh, after the exam, but before the scores are known. But other places have it after the scores are known. But no matter when it happens, so there are two things uh, 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 you need. One is the exam scores, the second is your preference. So this is from the demand side for education. From the college side, each college has an admission team uh, that is sent to every province. Uh, so the admission is 
99 uh, percent is based on the college entrance exam scores. Uh, I was lucky to be one, on one of the team last year. Uh, I went to my hometown, Jilin, just trying to uh, get the top one student in art and social science. And we did it, actually. We are mainly competing with another school in China, actually. It's called Peking University. So I'm from Tsinghua. Uh, <laughs> the quotas of each college in each province is centrally determined by the Ministry of Education. But a college has some freedom to allocate these quotas in different uh, fields, also in different provinces. So there's some freedom. But in the end, you have to uh, send, it, send your application to the Ministry of Education. We will get a final ap uh, approval. So I'm lucky to get a very good data. Actually, this is the best data anyone can get, actually. I got the population of all uh, college entry exam takers for one year. Uh, this is 2003. So the data has 6.2 million uh, uh, point uh, students. Uh, uh, let me skip this uh, data this description, since this is not an economic seminar. Uh, so what kind of college do we have in China? Uh, Basically, there are two, I mean, there are more, more than I have here, but there are, basically there are two, two, big, big, two broad uh, categories. One is called colleges. Uh, uh, I think it's similar uh, to the community uh, college or techn technical college here in the US. Uh, it takes two to three years. Uh, and the second kind, which is more important, uh, is universities, because they give you a bachelor degree. Uh, it takes about four years, sometimes uh, five years or six years. So there are three kind of uh, so-called universities in China. The top ones are the elite uh, universities like Harvard, MIT, or uh, Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, it has uh, nine, uh, it's called nine, 985 program uh, universities. Basically, this, is, this name is, is, is given because uh, in May 1998, the then President Jiang Zemin uh, gave a speech uh, at the 100th anniversary of Peking University. Uh, he said, wish to build some world-class uh, universities. Then we named the top universities in China called 985 universities. Uh, uh, this year will be Tsinghua's 100th anniversary, so just in a, uh, a few weeks. So I hope there is another speech, and then there will be another name yeah, yeah, in China. <laughs> and the second type is called uh, 211 universities. This is something called, we should build 100 good universities in the 21st century. So both numbers come with money, actually. 985 means more money than 211. 211 still has money, actually. Uh, for example, for uh, Tsinghua, my university, and Peking, the two top universities, for the 985 program, uh, for this round, the central government gave each university 3.3 uh, billion yuan, actually. This is one short investment. But other universities on the program get much less, actually, maybe one. Uh, one sixth or one fifth of, of the money Tsinghua uh, and Peking got. Uh, uh, besides this elite and good universities, uh, the other uni universities, there are many of those, like uh, 1,000 uh, 1, to 2,000 uh, universities. Uh, so this is the admission rate for each type of college in China. Uh, as you can see that among all the exam takers, 6.2 million, about 70% were admitted to colleges our universities. Uh, about one third uh, were admitted by uh, universities of all kinds. Uh, only about 7% went to the top or elite universities, including uh, 211, 985, and top uh, universities in China. So the admission rate to elite universities is really small. Uh, uh, that's why I think there's a huge market uh, for higher education. Uh, in the U.S. or Europe um, for Chinese students. Uh, so this is a major allocation, uh, uh, similar to uh, many other countries. Uh, engineering is the largest field in China, that's uh, about 37%, followed by uh, art social science, 19%, and management, 18%. Uh, economics is also pretty big, actually, uh, 5%. Uh, so I benchmarked uh, this data to the uh, uh, census in 2000. Uh, of, of course, the same cohort uh, to see how representative this data compared to the uh, 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 population. As you can see that uh, the red one is my, uh, my data and the, uh, uh, the green or blue one is the population. Uh, there are fewer females uh, who take the exams and 
much fewer rural kids take the exam. Only about half the rural kids are taking the exams. Uh, that's why the red one is lower than the, uh, the blue one. Uh, so in the second part of my talk, I'm going to uh, 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 talk about a few uh, dimensions where uh, inequalities uh, exist in education. The first one, gender bias. So this is the uh, percentage, uh, a percentile of, uh, uh, of the exam scores for males and females, uh, uh, respectively. Uh, blue ones, male, uh, uh, females, uh, the red ones. As you can see that, uh, uh, for the total score, uh, females are doing a little bit better than males. For math, males are doing better, about uh, 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 1.6 uh, percent, uh, percentile better. But for Chinese and English, females are doing a lot better, actually. Uh, about uh, 6 uh, percentile to almost 9 percentile are better. Uh, as you can see, that when I took the exam about 20 years ago, there's more emphasis on science, actually. We have seven subjects, including physics, chemistry, biology, each uh, independent subject. Now we only have four, math, Chinese, English, and composite. That means we are putting a larger weight on Chinese English today, which will benefit ladies, actually, women, actually, uh, uh, because uh, girls are doing better in Chinese and English uh, from this side, we can see. So this is the uh, top students uh, in both sets, uh, uh, short sets. Uh, basically, the three uh, 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 pairs of, 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 of bars say the same thing. For uh, the top, Science students, they are more males than females, only about 33% females. But for the top social science and art students, 62% are females. That means males are doing better in science, and females are doing better in social science and arts in the exams. So this is admission. Uh, when you go from the left to the right, Basically, we go up the hierarchy of the universities. Uh, the red one is uh, the best one, top two, uh, Peking and Tsinghua. Uh, as you can see that, although females are, are doing uh, uh, pretty well, actually, for colleges and for all universities, they still have a less chance compared to males uh, in terms of entering a, a top university or elite university in China. Uh, the second bias, uh, I call it uh, uh, urban or rural bias. Uh, uh, is related to Hukou. So in this chart, basically, uh, again, from left to right, uh, we go up, move up to the uh, university hierarchy. Uh, the right is the best. Uh, so the, the line, uh, uh, there is the uh, sample average uh, of rural, rural students, about uh, 52%. As you can see, when you go move up to the uh, university hierarchy, there are fewer and fewer rural kids who can enter these universities. Uh, uh, for colleges of all types, the rural uh, sample is just, uh, just break even. It basically means uh, rural kids and urban kids have the same chance of entering any college. But for universities, good university 211 and elite universities, there's a much less chance for rural kids to enter those. Uh, for the top two, Peking and Tsinghua, uh, there are only about 18% rural uh, children who can enter those uh, two elite uh, colleges. The third one is uh, called income bias. Uh, well, I don't have income in the data. Uh, we can imply from certain uh, other variables. Uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, access I, I, I do here. Uh, once I look at uh, the repeated uh, exam takers, who, if you all uh, take the exam this year, I, you don't uh, feel satisfied, you can take it again next year. You have to wait for one year, actually. Who are willing to wait one more year? Of course, those are the kids who have a smaller opportunity cost of staying in school. Uh, most likely, to from, uh, they are from the rich families. Uh, uh, so the second exercise I, I look at is, uh, look at the so-called elite high schools. I'm going to define this. Uh, uh, Later. Uh, so this is the look at the uh, whether repeating, uh, repeatedly taking the exam will help improve your scores. Uh, I just 
do a simple, a simple uh, comparison bit, uh, of the uh, repeated exam takers and the first time exam takers. The red ones are the repeated takers. You can see that if you take it twice or three times, you can do much better than the first time takers. Uh, so the average advantage is about 10 percentile in almost every subject. Uh, 10 percentile means what? Means 600 thousand people actually. <laughs> That's a lot of people actually. Uh, uh, you can move up uh, one level in the uh, university hierarchy. So this is the number of high schools in each province in China actually. Uh, some provinces have more high schools, some have fewer. Uh, 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 for each high school, I can count the number of successful applicants uh, for them to the top two. And by counting this, I can cal calculate the Gini coefficient of, uh, of the uh, successful uh, students uh, to each level of university. Uh, remember, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned about China has a very high and rising Gini coefficient. Uh, some suspect that it's over uh, 0.5. 0.5 Gini coefficient means very high inequality in the society. But compared to my inequality, that one is so small, actually. Uh, look at the top two uh, in Gini coefficient for the top two universities. It's about 96. And even for all universities, universities, 71%, which are extremely high, this Gini coefficient. I also look at the elite high schools, basically the top 10 high school and top five high school, see how many of the top university students are produced by these high schools. For the top two universities of China, top 10 high school, top 10 percent of high schools produce 100 percent of students to these uh, universities. They also produce uh, 91 percent to the top nine and 76 percent to the uh, elite universities. That means if you don't go to a top high school in your hometown, there's no chance to, for you to enter a elite college in China. So where, uh, which, which province, which region has uh, the Gini coefficient higher? Basically, this is uh, all part 30 provinces in China. Uh, I, I see that I'm running out of time. Uh, basically, this figure sh shows that the poorer the province is, the larger the Gini coefficient. Uh, <coughs> So the last one is called home bias. Uh, basically, this is the number of colleges in each province. You, you can see that it's very unevenly distributed. Uh, Shandong has 133, and Tibet only has two. This is the number of uh, elite colleges. Uh, Beijing has eight. And remember, Beijing is only a city. It has a population of uh, only 20 million. Uh, it has most of uh, the uh, best schools uh, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Jiangsu, three provinces. Uh, this is the admission uh, from, uh, 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 by local universities. Uh, uh, all of these are very high, actually. For elite, our 1985 is about 40%. For the top nine, about 40%. Uh, so this is the admission rate for uh, different provinces into universities. Now, uh, some provinces have a very high admission rate, but other provinces have very low admission rate. Remember, all these universities are public universities. They are all funded by uh, the government money. Uh, this is a simple regression. Basically, I show that the more colleges your province has, the more likely you are going to enter a, a college, actually. Uh, this is a very simple regression. Uh, so, so much for data. Uh, what can we say from this uh, uh, simple description of the data? Uh, who have the largest chance to enter a college or enter an elite college in China? They are the rich urban boys from elite high schools located in a good province. So, so basically, you should choose a family to be born, actually. Uh, uh, uh. So the college entry exams are not so fair as many believe, because China always believe this exam is the fairest uh, system in China. But still, you can see that your, where you're born really matters a lot in China. So what can we see from gender bias? Basically, males are doing science, females are doing social science. Social science. I don't know if it's good or bad. Could it be good? But still, it's hard for females to go to elite university, and how the exam structure to affect uh, the gender balance. For income bias, uh, income starts to play a role as early as the compulsory education stage, because parents need to pay to get their kids trained in primary school and junior high school in order to get into the elite high school. 
This also has implications on intergenerational transfer. The poor of the next generation will have low education and they will remain poor. Inequality will sustain. So there's also an implication for Hukou. Every Chinese is born with a Hukou. Uh, this is called the household registration. Uh, it defines whether you're rural or urban and which city you belong to. So after 30 years of reforms, Hukou is becoming more and more valuable in China, especially for Beijing and Shanghai Hukou. Today, you need a hukou to buy a car in Beijing. You need a hukou to buy a house in Beijing. And you need a hukou to have a larger chance to enter elite college if your Beijing has a Beijing hukou. Uh, so it has been a main source of inequality in China. So I'm running out of time. Uh, but uh, this is the one Clay wanted me to talk about. So uh, I should do it, right? Uh, it has also some challenges to government's rebalancing policies uh, towards the poor poor areas, basically rural and western areas. Uh, think about this. Human capital will be the key for China's growth in the next 30 years. I think Scott and also uh, Hai Zheng will talk about tomorrow. Uh, but poor areas have lower human capital because uh, lower chances of going to a college. And well-educated people won't return to these poor provinces. I'm going to stop, stop here. Uh,